Let's open in our Bibles to Genesis 12. And as you're turning there, I ask the prayer corps to especially pray tonight uh, that everyone would stay awake because this is such an important message. And John picked this group, so we're all awake. And we appreciate uh, your, your ministry to us and leading us and serving the Lord and helping us to praise our God. But the reason it's so important as we go to Genesis 12 tonight is your whole understanding of the Bible is predicated on who exactly you think Israel is. Did you know that's the dividing line between dispensational and covenant theology? Who is Israel? Is Israel literally the chosen people of promise that God made eternal covenants with? Or is Israel the church? the new Israel, and all those promises that he made and all those covenants he made and the pathway of blood he walked and said, I am swearing by myself and by no other and I'm going to keep my word to give you this land and, and all those other promises. Have all those switched over to us? See, that's really important. See, eschatology is not just to sell novels for Tim LaHaye and make great movies that keep people on the edge of their seats and have Hal Lindsey hold us spellbound in his late great planet Earth. It's more than that. Either you can read the Bible and God means what he said, or someone has to provide you a key and you have to hold that key up. It's like code. And you've got to look at the key and say, well, Uh, that means this, oh, that must mean that. And all of a sudden, you can't really believe the Bible and understand it unless you have someone giving you a kind of an allegorical key to it. So really, tonight, looking at this is so important to understand the Bible. And let me explain to you why. Because when we approach God's Word, we know that God has clearly and simply laid out His Word for us to know and to confidently live from And by the way, the early church, the first century church, was overwhelmingly primarily made up of slaves who did not get to go to higher education. So the New Testament was written with, you know, eternally high theology written at a level where the slaves could hear it when they came to church after working all day. You know why people were falling out the windows and and dying during Paul's sermons because they were slaves and they had worked since sunup and they worked till sunset. Then they went to church and sat for hours and hours of of teaching and they just fell asleep. And, And if you remember, Eutychus just fell right out the window and died. But Paul brought the truth down where the the people, the, the simple, as he put it in 1 Corinthians, could understand it. And Jesus did too. Jesus said the common people received him, the scriptures say, gladly. They understood his stories. They understood his truth. See, God, God put all of his cookies on the bottom shelf. The Bible is not written for spiritual giraffes, you know, for the people that are only in the treetops. It's written down here where, where all of us can understand it. So with that in mind, God said the most fundamental truth in the Scripture is that God has an eternal plan for a group of people that He chose and He promised them a lot of things. And more than 35% of the Bible is written specifically to them. I don't know if you realize that. The vast majority of the promises that have not yet been fulfilled are not written to us, the church. In fact, the second coming, you all believe in the second coming, right? Isn't that one of the fundamental doctrines? Do you know what the second coming is for? Jesus Christ comes back specifically to rescue Israel. Now you have to decide who Israel is. Either he's coming to rescue the church that's surrounded by all the armies of the world and they're doing a genocide holocaust on us, or he's coming to rescue the descendants of Abraham the chosen people of promise, called the Jews, the nation of Israel. That's the conflict. And no matter what your background has been in understanding the Bible, there are three markers that God has laid down in His Word that are very clear. The first one's right here in Genesis 12. And that marker is God made an eternal covenant. And He promised to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants, the Israelites or the Jewish people, that they would be his chosen people of promise. And God starts with a a, a kind of a 
short promise in chapter 12, and it goes all the way through and gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then he just keeps enlarging on it in the succeeding generations. He makes another one to Isaac, and he amplifies it with Jacob, and then he really amplifies it with Moses, and then he makes it huge with David. And that's a very important marker. God explains through Paul that the root is Israel into which the church has been grafted. Have you ever read Romans 9, 10, and 11? You know what that was written for? It was written for a little bit of pride that was showing up in the church, that the church thought that they were greater than Israel because Israel, even in the first century, was in unbelief. Israel's never been in belief since Abraham. And even David couldn't get them all going. Uh, Even the the mighty kings and the reforms of Josiah couldn't get Israel to really get in step. And they weren't in step in the New Testament times. Only a small portion of them came to faith in Christ. Even though they had the preaching of the apostles, even though they had the Lord's own earthly brother, James, as their pastor, they never got in step with the program, the Jewish people. Now, the believers did, the remnant, but not the Jewish nation. And so... Even in the first century, Paul, if you want to have some good, deep reading, read Romans 9, 10, and 11. In that, God reveals through Paul that his eternal promises have not changed. They're still to Israel, even though they are in unbelief, and God has set them aside for the present. And James, the pastor of the first church, the literal first church, said in Acts chapter 15 that when God is through with his work in the world through the church, He's going to return and work again with Israel. James understood eschatology, as did Paul and as did all the New Testament writers. But first of all, God made an eternal covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12. Paul reiterates that it's eternal and it's got a future in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And then God describes through everyone who sees the end of the world the same story. You say, why are we spending so much time on eschatology? Because God did. Fully a third of the Bible is still waiting to be unfolded in all those promises that are coming. And either you have to interpret them as health, wealth, and prosperity, as the the fringe elements of charismatics do, or you have to say that God has awful big plans for the nation of Israel. Because there are a lot of things that haven't happened yet that God promised would happen. And God describes through the eyes of everyone he allowed to see the end of the world. And who did did God give that view to? Well, Jesus in Matthew 24 as and, and Luke 21 and Mark 13 as we've been looking at. Paul, Paul gets to see the end of the world and he describes it in great detail. John, the apostle, sees it most of all of them. Ezekiel sees it. Daniel sees it. Zechariah sees it. And so on. And all of them that God brings into the opportunity to see the end of the world, they all see the same thing. That's what's so fascinating about this. They all record the same scenario. All of them say this, the world ends with Israel present, Judea as a noted geographic place, Jerusalem as a city, and the Jewish people. And those elements are the main geography and the central characters of the end of the world. And all of them say that the end of the world is triggered when the Jewish people are facing extinction and Jesus comes to rescue them. They all saw the same picture. It's like they're watching the same movie and they're talking about it. Now from different angles. Each of them has a different angle on the end. But all of them see the same scenario and the same characters. So all we can say is that if you believe in Christ's second coming, then the Bible describes him as coming to save a nation called Israel, an ethnic people called Jews from extinction for one reason. To keep his promise he made when he swore by himself, because he could swear by no greater, that he was going to save the people called Israel and the nation of descendants that were ethnically tied to Abraham, but that were through his son of promise, Isaac, not through his son of his disobedience, Ishmael. 
And that happens to be the conflict going on right now in the world, isn't it? You know what's going on right now? Who is the real God? Is it Allah of Ishmael and the Arab people and the Muslim faith? Or is it the true and living creator of heaven and earth, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, not Ishmael, and Jacob, not Muhammad? That's what the whole end of the world is about. And you know what? And, and I don't want to blow your circuits, but it, you've, most of us have read too many novels. The Bible does not specifically say that a European ruler over ten nations is going to be the Antichrist. It doesn't say that. It does say that there are ten toes and that whole thing that Daniel saw. But any of you that are history buffs know that the majority of the Roman Empire if you look at a map today, the majority of the Roman Empire is in what we would call Muslim countries today. Did you ever think of that? Do you ever think of why everybody in the book of Revelation is dying of a sword cutting their what off? Yeah, the same thing the terrorists use in those horror movies when they capture you know, Daniel Pearl and others and they hack their heads off and try and scare us Westerners. The Muslims' method of execution is the sword and beheading. And that's what we see all the way through. So before you start thinking we have another Hitler come and think we might have another you know, Arab Muslim terrorist coming that's going to run the world. And so just, you know, the Bible doesn't say it's Western or European or uh, of a Judeo-Christian background. It's very possible the end of the world is totally surrounding the Muslims. It could be that they start winning. And, and that should be interesting for us to think about. Well... Let's talk about God's chosen people of destiny. As we open to Genesis 12 this evening and read the first nine verses, we must remember that the history of our salvation is inextricably bound up in the history of God's chosen people of destiny, the Jews. Never forget that. Paul reminded us of that. That's why many years ago, when a great Bible conference speaker was asked to prove the inspiration of Scripture, in one sentence he replied, I will do it in one word, Jews. He said that's the greatest proof of the inspiration of God's Word. And it's interesting to think that there's one nation on earth that was picked by God to be the bearer of truth, the begetter of the line of Messiah, and to be a blessing to all nations, and that was Israel. And the Jewish people are God's people, and the Jewish customs are God's shadow of things yet to come. And so Genesis 12 introduces us to that truth as we read together the first nine verses. And let's stand up and listen with our hearts to what the Lord God said to Abraham. And as I read these verses, I think about just a week ago we were weaving through the bus and I'm very easily carsick. I get carsick in the back seat of a car if I'm not driving. In fact, I can get a little woozy in the driver's, I mean in the passenger side. So I basically hog the steering wheel and drink coffee the whole time so I don't get sick. And here I was weaving on this bus that was going through the Negev like this and all the people were chattering along and I was taking my drama means, you know, and looking out the windows and saying, honey, look, this is where Abraham walked. This is where Abraham fed his sheep. You can still see the sheep tracks, the crosshatch on the hillsides. They're still there have been there for thousands of years. They use the same hills from the Bible times onward. And I thought, this is where God said this. And I have, and I pulled out my Bible, and I thought, I can hear what God said to Abraham 4,000 years ago. Perfect recording. The DVD is not scratched, okay? We have not lost it. It's not been ruined. We have it. So let's listen to Genesis 12, the first nine verses. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you... All the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now, just a second, you know, you have to a little get your study Bible out, but this call to Abraham came when he was 60. And he took a little 15 year detour in Haran with his 
with his father, Terah. And verse 5, Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom he had acquired in Haran, and they came and they departed to go into the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. By the way, God calls it Canaan. He does not call it Palestine. That is a new term. It's too bad they put it in your Bible. It's not in the Bible. It's not Palestine. That is an invention of modern people to try and give a basis for uh, whatever is going on. But never mind. Verse 6. So Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Moreh. And the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, so here's, years have gone by since verse 1, 2, and 3. And the Lord appeared to him. Boy, Abraham had faith. The Lord only showed up every 15 or 20 years and talked to him, and he just kept going like the Energizer Bunny. What faith he had. You know, I mean, we get all rattled if we don't feel the Lord every moment. And he only heard from him every decade. It's unbelievable. But the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants, your descendants. Now, if you were a shepherd, grazing man, living in a tent 4,000 years ago, what would you think that meant? To his descendants, right? Yeah, that's probably what it means. To your descendants, I will give this land. And look at what Abraham did. There he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Verse 8, And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abraham journeyed going on toward the south. Wow. You say, that's amazing. Yeah, it is. God twice, and we haven't even gotten into the big ones, promised him that place and that his descendants would have that. And later he adds, forever. 